to him that difficulty please.
But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from the farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and I cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you not, shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, and hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the fourth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And will those who came without difficulty please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing, I am trusting me, Lord Jesus.
and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In our Gospel lesson, Jesus tells us not to worry, but all of us worry. And we look for ways to try to stop that worry, but nothing ever seems to work. Well, in Guatemala and parts of Mexico, they have something called worry dolls. These are very small dolls, usually less than two inches tall, made of cloth and wire. And they are given to children as friends with whom they can share their thoughts and fears. The dolls are said to be rooted in Mayan folklore, which tells of a sun god giving a princess a gift to help her face her fears in life. Mostly today, tourists are the only ones that buy the worry dolls. However, some child psychologists use a similar approach to a child's anxiety, offering them a doll to be the child's imaginary friend to whom they can tell their darkest secrets. It starts early, this anxiety we have for tomorrow. Our fear of the future can paralyze us in the present, leaving us burdened and even immobilized. Americans, according to an article in the New York Times in 2015, said that we spend $2 billion a year on anxiety medication. $2 billion. The medicine to keep us from worrying or being anxious. We are among the most anxious and medicated nations in the world. We worry about everything. We worry about having enough money. We worry about our health. We worry about our appearance. We worry about our relationships. We worry about our jobs. We worry about what we wear. We worry about just about everything else to the point that we even worry about whether or not something is worth worrying about. Almost 500 years ago, French essayist Michael de Montaigne wrote, quote, My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which he never had. In other words, it was all in his imagination. His worst fears never materialized, and that is the way with most of us. We fear things that are never going to happen. We worry about things that never transpire. And so we become anxious. Anxiety is frightened imagination focused on the worst that could happen. Now people in Jesus' day worried as well. But their worries were more basic than others. They worried about would they eat that day? And if so, what would they eat? What would they drink that day? And would they be able to draw water from the town well or buy some goat milk or something to drink? They worried about what they would wear. Did they have anything that wasn't tattered and ripped and stained and didn't have holes in it? And the final worry was, would they possibly do something that day which would bring about the wrath of the Romans occupying their nation? But, just like us, they followed the same line. Their fears drove them to imagine the worst. In the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, fear is often the enemy of faith. Now, we would expect doubt to be the enemy of faith. But in reality, as we look at Jesus and the incidences he was in and the teachings he made, the biggest enemy of faith is fear. For an example, in the 8th chapter of Matthew, we read about 
Jesus and the disciples get into a boat and setting sail across Lake Galilee. As they are about halfway across, a ferocious storm breaks out. The water begins coming over the boat, and the disciples panic and afraid they're going to drown. Jesus is asleep, totally oblivious to what is going on. The disciples run up to Jesus in a panic, and they wake him up and they say, Lord, don't you care if we perish? And Jesus responds in the 26th verse of that 8th chapter with these words, Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. That word we translate as afraid literally means to be faithless. Why are you faithless, oh, you of little faith? You are my disciples. You have been with me day after day. You have seen what I can do. And yet you are panicking in the midst of a storm. Why are you so faithless, you little faith? So when Jesus addresses our anxieties, it's not surprising that he makes it an issue of faith. As we read in our gospel lesson, to make a lesson to teach us about faith and to have faith and not to worry, he points us to God's creation. How God takes care of the birds of the air, the lilies and grass of the field. There is a beautiful lesson to greater argument here. It runs as follows. If God, the creator, cares for the birds and lilies and grass he has created, Remember, he simply spoke them into being. How much more will God, our Heavenly Father, care for us as children? Those of us which he made lovingly out of the dust of the earth and then breathed the breath of life into us. He didn't just speak us into existence. He created us from the dust and filled us with the Spirit. So if he cares about the lilies and the birds and the grass, how much more? Will he care for us? There is also a beautiful irony here that these lesser creatures of God's creation teach us nervous human beings the crown of God's creation something about God's providing. A little sparrow here a fragrant lily there, tass of grass blowing gently in the wind. They are a chorus of witnesses to the trustworthy care God gives every corner of his creation. C.S. Lewis, famous English writer and theologian, in his study of scriptures identified four great analogies in the Bible for God's love towards us. They are in the sending order. First is the love of an artist toward her creation. The way a potter loves her cup or vase or bowl as it comes off the pottery. This is God's relationship with the birds and the lilies and the rest of his creation. Second is the love of a master for a beast. The way a shepherd loves his sheep or the way we love our dog, or even a cat. Third is the love of a parent for a child, the way a waiting dad graciously welcomes home a runaway son. This is where we fit in the Sermon on the Mount. We are our Heavenly Father's children, and He will love us to the end. The fourth level of love is that of a spouse for the other, and how faithfully they support and encourage one another. The role of the Spirit in our life is in 
supports, encourages us in our journey of faith. Jesus is telling us that the antidote to worry and anxiety is trust in God's proven love for us. He's not saying that bad things will happen to us. He's not saying that we can sit back and wait to be fed like some Elijah in the desert. When I was serving my first parish in Evansville, Indiana, there was a bookstore down the street from the church, and a Christian bookstore, and I would go in there quite often, and I became good friends with the owner of the uh, bookstore. And one day we were talking, and she told me how her husband had lost his job. And I told her I was sorry to hear that, and I said, well, is he out looking for a new job? And she said, no, he's at home sitting in his recliner. He knows God will give him a job, so he's just waiting there for God to bring it to him. I said, maybe it might help if he looked at the one ad and maybe visited a few places, and maybe then God would give him a job. See, God's not telling us that have trust in him means we give up working for what we eat or stop praying for what we need. So this is not a permission to stop using what God has given us. This is Jesus saying to trust in God, to trust in God's prevailing persistent and persistent love. And that will displace worry and anxiety. This is why St. Paul could write in our second reading for today, the fourth chapter of Philippians. In verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. The word anxious literally means <coughs> to worry or to be pulled apart because you're worrying so much. Your worries are ready to just pull yourself apart. So he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, that is in every situation you're in, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And when he says, by prayer, this literally means earnest prayer. It means prayer in which you can go in your whole being into it. It's like Jesus praying in the garden of his sin. It's not simply saying a prayer quickly or reading a prayer out of a prayer book as quick as you can. It means for us to put our entire heart, soul, mind, and being in that prayer, praying earnestly. And to give supplication, that is asking for a particular benefit. And then he says, as we pray, no matter the situation, we do this with thanksgiving, thanking God for all that we have. And we let our request, things asked for, be made known to him, to be revealed to him, to be presented to him, to declare them to him. So this is how St. Paul is saying we can stop being anxious, stop worrying, stop tearing ourselves apart by praying and giving thanks again. Acts of trust like prayer and thanksgiving displace worry. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth I of England, her Lord Treasurer was a man named Sir William Cecil. And Sir William Cecil had the following practice every night when he would go to bed. He would go to his room and he would take off his official robe and he would lay it down somewhere. And he'd say, lie there, Lord Treasure, bidding adieu to all state affairs so that he might walk quietly rest. That is what we should do. When we are engaged in a practice of our faith, whether it's hearing a sermon, a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study, whether we are praying or coming to the Lord's table, we should put aside all affairs of this life so that we may concentrate fully on the worship of God. And there is more. Jesus says that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
And all these things will be added. The 33rd verse of our gospel this evening. To seek first the kingdom is to value our relationship with our Heavenly Father over everything else. It is to love the Lord most deeply. To seek His righteousness is to delight in and to follow the Lord will wholeheartedly. Sometimes today you see Christians who seem to be going about their faith and their commitment half-hearted. Like they're doing it because everybody in their family before them did it, and everybody in their present family is still doing it, so they're part of it. But that won't end the anxiety of the world. That won't seek the kingdom and the righteousness of God. We have to delight and follow wholeheartedly the Lord's will and direction for our life. We are hip deep in Lent. And in this Lent season, it is somewhat less overwhelming to hear Jesus call to trust Him. We look closer to the cross these days and find that truth there. Truth under the cross shall we identify. Under the cross, close to our dying Lord Jesus, we can hear his whispers and hear his shouts. At the end of his suffering, we can hear him say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That word commit, it means to deposit for protection. It means to present something to someone. It means to set something before someone for safekeeping. Jesus, when he said these words, was showing us he had so much trust in his Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Father as we should have such trust that he could willingly and confidently place his spirit into his Father's hands. He could deposit it there for its protection. He could set it before God for safekeeping and had no words about tomorrow. In God, Jesus falls asleep in his Father's arms, entrusting tomorrow and the next day to his problems. It may seem like an ending. It may seem like tomorrow has arrived and the worst has happened. Not so fast. Here at the cross, the Father is still listening. The Father is still caring. And the Father is still providing for His beloved Son and for us, His beloved children. Oh yes, this is a Father who can be trusted. So we can put down our worry bonds and rest in his love. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
begin and by those who came with that difficult and please me. God of creation, you clothe the flowers, you take care of the birds of the air, and you grant us everything we need. You have made us your beloved children. Forgive us for our worry and enable us to put our full trust in you. Lord, Lord I, believe. I believe. Help, Help my unbelief. God of creation, you provide government and order. When there is chaos and war, it is a direct result of human sin. Send your love to us and through us that peace would prevail in our world. Where there is need, use us to share out of the bounty you have first given us. Lord, Lord I, believe. I believe. Help, Help my unbelief. God of creation, Thank you for the gift of your church. Bind us together in unity. Make us a shining light on the hill. Draw all the nations to your church by your grace. Lord, Lord I, believe. I believe. Help my unbelief. God of creation, you have the power to bring health and healing. Where there is disease and sickness, bring the gift of a cure. Bring us all at last to the perfect health of your eternal kingdom. Lord, Lord I believe. I believe. Help, Help my unbelief. Into your hands, God of creation, we place all of our needs, knowing that you are the one who has all authority, power, grace, and mercy to do your will and turn unbelief into trust and belief. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace, who gives you his kingdom and takes away all worry, Grant me true trust and complete faith. Rejoice and be glad. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Before we sing the, the final hymn, Jesus, how to me, um, next week we will look at that portion of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Judge not, you will be judged as you judge others. He goes on to expand by saying, why do you try to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye and not see the law in your own eye? So uh, that is one of the more misused and misconstrued uh, words of Jesus. People use that judge not for, for not uh, holding up responsibility for keeping order. They use it to, for allowing people to do things they shouldn't do. But we will find out the true meaning of what Jesus was saying next week. Uh, so I invite anybody you know to come and hear as we examine and judge not. Uh, Jesus Pilot Me is in number 755 in our worship book if you'd like to read the music instead of just uh, the hymn. I went through it. I think all the words match uh, perfectly. Uh, so Jesus Pilot Me either from your hymn book 755, or sing it from the book.
That concludes our March 27, 2019 Lenten midweek service. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Telephone number is 937-323-7508. Our pastor is the Reverend John H. Pollock. His organist was Nick Nolte. Join us Sunday at 8 o'clock and 10.30 for our Sunday services. And then next Wednesday again at 1.30 and 6.30 for our midweek Lytton service.